Well, have a look at this. That's a pretty good question. Thanks, it's the first one. Sammy, do not go out embarrassing people like him on national TV. Mexican waves, absolutely none of it. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is a brand new show called The Wrap, and I'm Hugo Monia. And look at this programme as a one-stop shop for all of the great and the good in the rugby world. And we'd love you guys and girls at home to get involved. So leave comments in the comment section below using the hashtag The Wrap to be part of the conversation. Well, starting with the Northern Hemisphere and the Gallagher Premiership, and what a performance it was for Bristol Bears and for me, Semi Randrandra. He is most definitely one of the most devastating runners in the world. Look at how he sidestepped Jonathan Joseph. He's one on one with Josh Matavesi. It's embarrassing. Semi, just a quick word. He's got kids. Do not go out embarrassing people like him on national TV. But what a performance that was. Bristol Bears beating their local rivals 48 points to three, the biggest victory in the league. So now to Alliance Premier 15s. Well, Exeter Chiefs against Saracens is a fierce rivalry in the men's game. It's one which is starting to bear fruit as well in the women's game as well. Saracens, back-to-back -back champions, were on their way to winning their 34th consecutive victory. And that's before Kate Zachary got a big mitt charging down the ball and winning their first ever game against Saracens in their first season. Congratulations to them. Let's have a look at the table in the Gallagher Premiership. Bristol Bears, they're flying high on their top of that table. Second is Exeter Chiefs, who are the current holders, as well as Heineken Champions Cup holders. Third, Sale Sharks, and they look rejuvenated under the captaincy and tutelage of John O'Ross and Alex Sanderson. And Newcastle, so third play to Sale in Newcastle, really flying the flag for the teams up north. When the Alliance 15 were Harlequins, I mean, they are flying high. Eight from eight and haven't dropped a single point. Saracens still remain their spot in second position. What's ladies who are flying as well? Brilliant coach in Giselle Mather, who's done brilliant work in the men's and the women's game. And to round off that top four, Loughborough Lightning. It was a busy weekend in the top 14 and congratulations to Bordeaux who claimed a rare away victory at Claremont over there. So congratulations to them and it has had an impact on the top 14. Toulouse, the darlings of France, well they're sat in top place. You've got La Rochelle second with a brilliant coach in Ronan O'Gara. Racing 92 are in third place and in fourth Bordeaux with that significant victory at the weekend. How about Joe Marler? Pulled out of the Six Nations to be at home to be a father. Have you ever seen Joe Marler in a princess dress? Well, have a look at this. <whistles> Devastating stuff. I think you look glorious, actually. Certainly got the hair for it. I think it really suits him, to be perfectly honest. And I'll tell you what, imagine what it's going to be like when we can get back into the stands, drink a beer, hug one another and celebrate. And that's exactly what the La Défense Arena in Paris is all about. It's about expression, it's about celebration and jubilation. Look at this for a conga. I can just about cope with a conga. When we do get fans back in the stands, can we just say, this just between you and I, and leave it in the comment section below, I don't want to see any Mexican ways. The conga's fine. Congress fine, Mexican waves, absolutely none of it. So we're into the Southern Hemisphere and South Africa, where we start with the Carling Curry Cup. It was played between the Vodacom Bulls as well as the Sharks. And it's a game that really had everything 19 all before they went into extra time. It had, the game had to be stopped for Lightning. And we had plenty of thunder on the pitch as well in the form of Arno Botha, who scored the all important match winning tries. Congratulations to the Vodacom Bulls there. And part of that team is Dwayne Vermeulen. Who remembers him from the World Cup final? He had a magnificent performance, picking up the man of the match. He is the second player to win the Curry Cup with three separate teams. Question to you guys and girls at home is, who was the first? Leave it in the comments section below using the hashtag the rap. And also, I was watching 2021. It was like a throwback to 2009. Mornay Stone, he broke my heart, as well as every British and Irish line's hearts as well. But he is still playing and flying at the age of 36, doing his bit. Well now, down to New Zealand. I'll tell you what, their conveyor belt talent, it continues. Some people have used lockdown to get fat, 
Some have used it to get fit. Well, this schoolboy, he is squatting 300 kilograms. 300 kilograms, just to put it into some sense of context, that's three of me on his back. He's got his bum to his heels and back up again. Fair play to him, we know rugby is all about skill, but you've got to be strong as well, so good on you. Just keep you up to date with the 2021 Rugby World Cup where the fixtures are out, so get online, pick your team, find your pool, should be absolutely fantastic. So many key matchups, I think it starts with New Zealand against Australia. So many great matchups. Have a look at that. And we've also got the final round of the Rugby Europe Championship, a tournament which has been displaced by 11 months, had to pause due to COVID on the 7th of March. And the final round of that is going to be next weekend. So we'll be back next week to react to all the news of that competition. So just a reminder, the 2021 Guinness Six Nations Tournament cracks on this weekend. We've Italy taken on one of the favourites, France, and then we've got England against Scotland in the Calcutta Cup. And on Sunday, a titanic battle between Wales and Ireland. The most searched thing on Google about world rugby is the world rugby ranking. So here on The Wrap, we're going to update you of exactly what is what. South Africa, World Cup champions are in at number one. England, number two. New Zealand, number three. France, and they are flying at number four. Hosting 2023, things are looking very good for them. Ireland, number five. Australia, number six. Scotland, number seven. Argentina, and what a memorable victory that was against the mighty All Blacks early in the year. And at number nine, you have Wales, and what a fall from grace it's been for them. Just over a year ago, they were the number one ranked side in the world, albeit for 24 hours, but they're now down at number nine. And to round off the top 10 is Japan, a team that has grown from strength to strength, getting to their first ever Rugby World Cup quarterfinal in what was an unbelievable tournament. So that's how the world rankings look for now, but for the here and now, it's the Six Nations starting this weekend, the most historic rugby tournament in the world. And I'm thrilled to say that we are joined by James Hallwell to give us an impartial view over the Six Nations. But first, James, great to see you. How are you and the family getting on? Yeah, very well, mate. Enjoying, uh, not at, or not enjoying lockdown that much, but uh, all things considered, we're, get, we're getting on okay. So uh, it'd be nice to get a bit nicer weather outside, but other than that, yeah, can't complain. Fair play. And mate, you're moving back to Australia at some point later on this year, aren't you? Yeah, I've, uh, I've decided I've, I've had enough of the ground. I've been here nearly six years, so uh, <laughs> it's nice to get home and get some sunshine. I need to work on this tan. I'm, uh, I'm getting whiter by the day. Mate, that's really exciting times. However, we've seen what's happened with the Australian Open and all the tennis players that have had to go into quarantine and Novak Djokovic with his list of demands as to what he wanted. Um, tell us, James, the thought of going back home is really exciting, but quarantine with a young one and a baby on its way. <laughs> tell us, <laughs> how are you feeling about that? Yeah, I haven't really, haven't really thought too much about that. I'll, I'll cross that when I come to it. But yeah, to, no matter who comes into the country, we got 14 days in a hotel room. Um, it's really luck of the draw what, what sort of hotel room you get. You get. So... Uh, yeah, I, I haven't now until you brought it up there, mate. I hadn't really given it much thought. It was just about sort of organising step by step. But yeah, look, uh, we'll cross that bridge. But it'll be a, it'll be a decent slog for for fourteen days. So of course, it's really exciting weekend. They're all looking forward to the Guinness Six Nations, the most historic tournament in the world: England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Italy. And France, it all kicks off with Italy against France. We're going to go through the teams, uh, team by team. Italy, yet to win a game in five years in this tournament. Do you see it happen in 2021? Uh, not really, no. I don't, to be honest. I think, look, I think Italy are a, are a team, you know, when you watch them play, they, you know, even when you played them for Australia, they always made it difficult. They always made life hard, but they just could, couldn't seem to sustain that, that level of intensity for a full 80 minutes and the, and the class seems to show. And I think with the, the teams that we have in the Six Nations at the moment and the depth that a lot of the squads have shown, I think it would be very difficult for, for Italy to, to maintain that intensity. I mean, I think it would be great for the tournament if they did win. You know, as, as a fan, I think it would be fantastic. And I, I really do hope they, they can pull something out of the bag. But I, I just think that 
uh, based on the, the other teams and the, the looking at the depth that the squads have, I, I, I think it's going to be a tall ask for them. Yeah, it's going to be really tough, especially coming up against one of the favourites for the tournament in France. I mean, they've had a wonderful 2020. How do you think this side can kick off from all the potential that they showed us last year? Yeah, look, I mean, France are a side that I, I really enjoy watching. I think, you know, any time you turn on the TV and know that France are playing, you know, you're glued to the TV about what they're going to do, how they're going to play. I think a couple of their key injuries that might hurt them a bit, Vakatao missing, Aldred, I think, at number eight, I think was, a, you know, he was amazing and immense last year. And I think that's a guy that they'll really miss. Um, but when you've got someone like DuPont, who's, you know, quite easily the best number nine in the world rugby at the moment, I think, pulling the strings, you know, anything could happen. So I, I, I hope they can kick on. I think it's exciting for world rugby. I think it's exciting for the Six Nations with the strong France. And, you know, I think they, they're, they're even with the injuries, I think there's still a chance at, um, you know, winning, winning the tournament. You're right, and DuPont last year became the first Frenchman to win the Guinness Six Nations player of the tournament. It's ridiculous when you consider the amount of legendary players that played there. But moving on to the game at Twickenham, is England against Scotland. And just for context, Scotland have not won at Twickenham since the year I was born, which isn't 1995. I know I look young. It was actually 1983. How excited are you about what they could potentially do this tournament? Yeah, look, I think the fact that Finn is back uh, is back in the squad and back playing, and you know we've seen what he's been able to do for Russing over the last couple of seasons, and particularly um, back playing. I think that's that's a big positive, and I think a lot of the Scottish hopes probably depend on on his shoulders and how well he plays. You know, he's a, he's sort of the guy that throws caution to the wind, and when it comes off, they look unbeatable. But sometimes, even you saw in the Champions Cup final, you know, he threw a couple of intercepts. He was sort of a bit rocks and diamonds, and then so. I think a lot of the hopes rely on him. You know, we, we know they've got a, you know, a bit of a grafting forward pack. Their back row are probably up there with as good as anyone in the competition. They, they're combative. They're, they're strong over the ball. They're going to make your, your life a you know, hard time at, at set piece. So I think a lot of it comes down as how well Finn can play and how well he can release, you know, the backs. And, and, and I guess stopping, you know, in this game, stopping England, how... You know, their big set piece, their big ball runners, whether they can get in get in their faces and slow the ball down enough to, to frustrate England. Well, England, I mean, they've got a slightly depleted squad considering the amount of strength and depth. No Makovinopolo, no Carl Sinclair, no Joe, Joe Launchbury and no Sam Underhill. With that level of experience out of the England forward pack, which you know very well, um, how do you think they'll cope and what kind of style of rugby do you think we'll see from Eddie Jones this Six Nations? Yeah, look, I, I think one thing with, with forwards in, in, in the UK and since coming to the Premiership, there seems to be a bit of a conveyor belt of big units coming off the line. And, and you know, Eddie's very lucky that he's got a, such a depth of, of squad that he can pick from. So, look, I think missing Mako and Joe at Loosehead is, is, a, is a big loss. Um, but also you, then you've got Ellis Gange who can come in. So, you, you know, you're quite lucky to have three Looseheads in, in the... Um, in the competition like that. And, and same with Sink on the other side. Look, I, I, I think the style, I, I can't see them doing too much different to what we've seen in the Autumn Nations Cup. I think they'll be very combative. I think they'll look to play on top of teams, but I think they'll, they'll look to play a, a territory focused game. I think they'll want to, they'll want to, particularly against Scotland, they'll want Finn to play out of his own zone. They'll want him to, to chance his arm. Huge game on Sunday, Wales take on Ireland. Um, Two teams that are living in this world of a bit of uncertainty. I'm not quite sure anyone knows what quite to expect from both sides. What do you expect to see from Wales? What do you expect to see from Ireland? Yeah, I, th I think you hit the nail on the head. I think particularly Wales, I don't think they know sort of their identity or what they're trying to do yet. I think they're still in a bit of a teething phase. Um, you know, I think the new coach has come in. They've obviously had Gatland, who's had a big, such a big impact on the not only on the, the way they play, but the squad and the mentality around the squad and the players. So I think for someone like Wales, they, they just need to win. I think that they just need to get the confidence. They don't, they look like they're playing without any confidence. I think Ireland is a little bit in the same boat. You know, again, they're sort of got a lot of key players that sort of dictate the way they play. And, and it's interesting to watch how they play. Look, they're, they're very, anytime you play on, they've always got some very structured sort of set piece plays that, the guys like Sexton and Murray sort of dictate the way they want to play. And I think that's 
that's still the same, but the game's moving on a bit. So I think again, they're in a bit in, in, in leeway as well about what they're going to de- what we're going to get and how they're going to play. Italy, France. Who's winning that one? France. Okay, England, Scotland. Uh, I'd have to say England because it's at Twickenham. Wales, Ireland. Who's winning that one? Uh, I'm going to say Ireland just because I, I still don't think Wales sort of know what they're doing and I think Ireland have got a, a better grasp, only just. Well, that's James Hallwell's thoughts. Of course, we'd love you guys to get involved as well using the hashtag The Wrap. Let us know who your tournament favourites are, who you think is going to win at the weekend. One massive aspect of sport that we all love is emotion. That's often best illustrated through the national anthems. Have a listen to this. So James, as an impartial viewer, spectator at the moment, um, who holds the best national anthem in the Six Nations? Um, I think from an impartial point of view, I, I quite like the Scottish anthem. Um, yeah. You know, I like the bagpipes. It's, it's sort of, it's quite stirring. Um, you know, obviously the Welsh anthems are, you know, great, but, you know, there's probably a, you know, the only time I've really ever heard it is in, in the millennium when it's full with the roof closed and it's quite a stirring sort of anthem. You can see the passion it dri- drives out of them. So, look, I think if you're just listening to the song on its own without actually the, putting it in situ, I'd say the, the Scottish na- national anthem is probably my favourite. I remember the first time I played Scotland at BT Murrayfield and we sang our anthem first and then went on to the Scotland one. And you're right, it's gripping. It's really emotional. So I was kind of trying to take it all in. Um, but at the same time, I found myself subconscious. I, I was humming it. Mm, I was humming yeah. their anthem. Um, I'm so glad it didn't get picked up on TV because I don't think it would have been lights. However, karma did come back to bite me in my backside. So I made a head-on tackle with Kelly Brown, knocked myself out and got carried off the pitch. So, yeah, when, when you're not from Scotland playing for England, don't sing their anthems. And, of course, we'd love you... Guys and girls at home to get involved using the hashtag The Rap. Let us know what your favourite national anthem is and who you like watching singing the national anthem the best. It's going to be interesting with, with no crowd effects here and the unadulterated voices and tones from our rugby players. So we asked you at home as to who you're most looking forward to watching in this Six Nation. Of course, the top of the list is the magician. That is Finn Russells. We'll see if he has the keys to unlock Um, this England defence this weekend. Pile on the dog with what a season he's having with Wash. Jordan Lama, the hot stepping fullback and winger, and Louis Rees Zamet. James, who are you most looking forward to watching this Guinness Six Nations? I I think, you know, probably from the French side, Antoine Dupont. I I enjoy, you know, as a as a neutral when you just watch it as a rugby fan, anytime he seems to be on the on the pitch, something happens, he's an exciting player to watch and as I said earlier, I, I genuinely think he's the best number nine in the world at the moment um, and the way he controls the game and just, you know, things seem to happen when he's on the pitch and, you know, when he's around the ball. So I'm excited to watch him play. Yeah, absolutely. He can move. Um, James, on that topic of moving, what's, what's your dancing like? Awful, mate. I'm not even going to pretend. I'm horrific. (laughs) I'm not going to put you on the spot now and get you to start throwing a few shapes. But just before we go and say goodbye to you, James, we're going to leave you with a person that's been exodus, been injured for a couple of years, been recalled to the Wales camp, and we have live footage of him reacting to Wave Pivak, naming him in this Guinness Six Nations. So James, a really interesting year always is when you're looking forward to a British and Irish Lions tour at the end of the season. And Australia Rugby Union have thrown their hat into the ring as well, saying we're more than happy to host the British and Irish Lions as well as Africa Rugby Union. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I think it you know it probably adds to what's been a bit of a weird old cup year, you know, 12, 18 months with uh, with COVID. I, I think. 
the first, you know, the, the priority needs to be try to see if they can play it in South Africa with fans. Now, if that can, and you know, obviously you've got to work on the timing when, if it has to be played this year, I think that it would be better to be served with fans watching than with no fans. I think it would almost be better to be played in Australia with fans because both South Africa and, you know, the British and Irish Lions will have a huge expat supporter base in within Australia that can come to it. Being part of 2013, seeing the sea of red coming through the towns everywhere you went against the provincial games, I think was what makes the tournament. And that needs to be the most important bit. But I think they need to be pragmatic and about it and look at how can we best get this done? Because I don't think anyone really wants to watch Alliance series with no one in the stands. A couple more questions on this as a player that's played against the Lions and captained Australia against the Lions, but also from a fan's perspective, if you were British and Irish, would you be up for travelling to Australia, quarantining for two weeks to watch a couple of games to come back to quarantine for two weeks? <laughs> as much as we know they love it. I think it's, you know, it's... As simple as that sounds, it might not be that simple. I know Australia have got a bunch of caps on the amount of people we can get back. And I know there's about 30,000 Aussies trying to get home that still can't get home from all over the world. I think they need to go through all the options to have it in South Africa if they can. And if that can't be done with fans, then that's when I think they should look elsewhere. James, you'll be home by the time if the Lions take place in Australia. You're sat in the stands. It's 30 degrees. You've got a couple of beers in your hand. Who are you cheering for? The British and Irish Lions or South Africa? Uh, That's a pretty good question. I don't actually know. Thanks. It's the first one. First good question I've asked, well, at least this interview, perhaps in the last 12 months. I don't, yeah, I don't, um, I haven't actually thought of that. I think it... Who do you like um, the least? Who do you hate the least, I should probably say? Because that's what it's going to come down to. Look, I think I think it's always nice to see, uh, you know, it's a big thing for the home nation, which would set, I assume would be South Africa at this point because that's who would be hosting. So, you know, and, and the Lions are a touring side. That's what they're renowned for. So, you know, it's a big thing. It happens at once every 12 years. I know the Lions, you know, you appreciate how big it is here when you live over here. And, you, you know, I've, been, I've seen the, how big the, the New Zealand series was. And, but, you know, it, it's even bigger for the home nation. You only get it once every 12 years and the players playing, there's not many players that, get two cracks at, at the Lions. I think we've only had one in Australian history that's had two two goes, which was George Smith, who played in the, the 01 series and then the 13 series. Other than that, no other player has really played in against Lions twice. So it's a it's a huge um, it's a huge event for, for the country. And I, I you know I think probably you know South Africa have had a had a few things going their way. So it'd be not, I'd probably you know be leaning towards them. But uh, but for no other reason than it's just nice to see the home the home side in, in brackets go well. Well, I've got another reason. If we do play in South Africa at the moment, we totally understand how severe and how um, COVID has really impacted everyone's life. But if the tour's to go ahead and we're able, and we're able to get fans in South Africa, they've got to lift their alcohol ban. Because I'm sorry, I am not going to South Africa for seven weeks and not having a beer. <laughs> like... I think, it a I, think just released, I think they've just lifted it. I saw it. I saw it. Have they? Or maybe not completely. They've they've uh, lessened the strictness of it. But uh, so they've gone down the Finn Russell Scotland camp. You're allowed two beers. Anything more, you get booted out, kind of thing. I think so. I think that's what they're they're looking for, which is uh, might be tough to manage in South Africa. Yes, we live in hope. We live in hope. So that's it for episode one of the wrap. Thank you to all of you guys and girls that have got involved and tuned in. And if you like what you've seen, hit the subscribe button. If you want to be part of the conversation, use the hashtag the wrap. Massive thank you to James Hall for coming on and casting your eyes over the up and coming Guinness Six Nations and what will happen with the Lions. We'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Well, wherever you are in the world, if you're in New Zealand, have fun because your world has opened up. In Australia, the same. You've even got the sun. And if you're here in Britain or Ireland, stay safe, wear a mask, wear a smile on your face too. We'll be back next week. Thank you.